quick tour, but we're going live soon. Yours looks rather fancy. I think no, it's just new build, babes. Cleaned it especially. Oh, everyone's coming in. Hi, everyone. Good to see you. It's filling up. Uh, we can see the participant numbers clocking up. So we'll just wait until it levels out and then we'll feel we've got you all together wherever you are. Laura, where are you? Where am I? I'm, my nest is in Lee Bridge. Hackney, deepest Hackney. Hackney. I just, I'm looking at some notes that I wrote down earlier. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, we're just waiting till everybody uh, arrives. The 76 of you at the moment, once the number stabilizes. I think we'll... once, once we hit 100, we should ring a bell and then start. <laughs> the game show. Oh. Yeah. Or maybe the, the 100th person gets a prize. Oh, that, no, then people will sign off and sign back in again. Yeah, that's true. We'll never get there. <laughs> <laughs> it's like one of those, don't you remember that boy that, like, yeah, like, uh, I was going to say something really on PC then, um, not funny. Um, maybe I'll give a print to the best question. That's a good idea. Should I do that? Yes, everyone will be asking for questions towards the second half, really. We'll let Laura get up ahead of steam, but we'll wait for everyone to arrive and then I'll I'll give Laura a proper introduction. <laughs> Grilling. Grilling. <laughs> Since I'm sitting in my kitchen, this is possible. I feel like you'd probably be a really good cook. What's your What's your best dish? What's your speciality? Probably a risotto, actually. Nothing too complicated. All in one pan, no washing. <laughs> Great. Okay, I think we can make a start. There's still a few more people coming in. So welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is David Campany. I'm a writer and a curator and a friend of Laura. This is a Photo London talk with Laura Panak. Um, I was just looking at Laura's website, and she has a very, very good bio. So if there are any photographers out there, uh, bios are the most difficult kind of text to write, especially if you're writing about yourself. <clears throat> Laura was just telling me a story about getting someone else to write your bio, which might be a good idea. Anyway, this is Laura's. Laura Panak is a London-based photographic artist. Renowned for her portraiture and social documentary work, she seeks to explore the complex relationship between subject and photographer. Her work has been exhibited extensively and published worldwide, including at the National Portrait Gallery, the Houses of Parliament, Somerset House and the Royal Festival Hall London. Her artwork has received much acclaim and won numerous awards. Laura, you must have written this yourself. Among which are the John Cavall Award, uh, the Vic Odden Prize, the World Press Photo Awards, the Julia Margaret Cameron Award and the HSBC Prix de la Photographie Prize. Driven by research-led self-initiated projects, uh, Laura seeks to fully understand the lives of those she captures on film in order to portray them as truthfully as possible, perceiving time, trust and understanding to be the key elements to achieving this. Many of her projects develop over several years, uh, helping her achieve a genuine connection between herself and her sitter, allowing her to capture the intimacy, shared ideas and shared experiences of this relationship. That's very nice. Very the, well. only thing, the only thing I should have changed is I hate using the word, which is now you shouldn't use as subject, because I think people used to sort of use it. And that actually, I, I think sitter is nicer. What do you think? I always think of somebody sitting as soon as you say that. But the vocabulary for photography is terribly limited. Uh, I know that some people think of subject as in subject to. Yeah, but also like objective, like treating somebody like an object or a subject. And I don't really like that. Yes. Maybe I'll change that. So I'm glad you read that out. Collaborator. Yes. How about that? Something yeah. like that. Well, we'll explore some of these ideas. So, Laura, you've got some visuals for us, which include your own work, but also some other points of reference, influences and such. So we'll let Laura get up ahead of steam and then I'll engage her with a conversation. But if anyone out there has any questions... Uh, you can type them into the Q&A box and I'll keep an eye on those. And when we get to the second half of the hour, uh, I'll be pulling on some of those. So you can drop them into the Q&A at any point during the conversation. Good. 
Over to you, Bill. Thanks. Um, well, thank you, everyone, for actually spending their Monday night uh, with us and me talk absolute nonsense and David blow our minds. Um, yeah, and to Photo London for hosting this as well. It's um, It's been a jam-packed week and weekend and uh, very inspiring um, and lovely to see some amazing friends and meet new people. Um, I when I when David and I talked about this, we kind of sort of came up with um, an idea of time being our holding theme. And I think that um, what I wanted to do is I'm just going to sort of start showing you a few images of mine. Um, and and the reason I'm kind of showing this is just sort of an introduction. I don't know. Can you see that? Can we can. That? All good. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is just kind of a bit of an introduction as to some images for me that despite the time that I've taken them, I seem to either kind of have people contact me or start conversations about them. Um, and what I love about that is kind of how each one has its own story, how each one um, brings a new narrative and how each person who comes to me with their story or their relationship with the image is different um, and how their narrative um, kind of comes into play and there doesn't seem to be I'm just going to shut the door because there's a bit of noise in a sec, sorry guys I'll tap dance for you if you like um, that's better um, there doesn't seem to be like a set rule of kind of you know what makes these images kind of um, maybe stand out within my portfolio there, there just seems to be kind of um, and also I think it's really difficult for most photographers to look at their own work objectively Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why a lot of people wait quite a long time before they edit projects, um, which I think is quite a useful tool, actually, because you're obviously going to have a different relationship with the work. I actually prefer editing right there and then and then coming back when it feels right. Um, but I think what's interesting is how different people are drawn to different images. So, for example, if I'm going to gift somebody a print um, or if you ask me to predict which image a person would like, it's kind of like choosing clothing sometimes. Um, or jewellery, it's it's so dependent on the, the person and how much you know them and their history and their story and their relationship. Because I think what's wonderful about images is that um, the reason that we are drawn to them is so varied and so subjective. And it can be for us, for other people, it can be for their content, their process, um, mm. or even, you know, kind of when we, we see that image. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, but I think what what I'm more interested in is looking at kind of how other images um, have kind of played a part in time and how these images that we look at, whether they be films, um, performances, poetry, photography, paintings, drawings, how these images come round again, again, again. So I kind of wanted to dissect that with David and, and mm. you know, you are a master of theory um, so and, and concept. So I kind of thought it would be interesting for us to have that conversation. So I've got like a few pointers that I've written down. Um, I also just wanted to sort of say a really quick kind of word about how obsessed I am with, with kind of like sort of finding those images that stand the test of time. And I think the inspiration for me is super important. Um, I actually have a friend who decided to completely cut himself off from all photography. Um, he doesn't look at any photography because he doesn't want to mimic anything. Mm -hmm. um, and I really respect and understand that. But for me, it would be cutting my nose off to spite my face because I, I absolutely love looking at work. Um, and, and I think that, you know, for me, something always comes from something else. Mm -hmm. uh, so as we're talking about time, you know, I, I have this Dropbox and I basically, anytime I see anything, I just screenshot it um write it down grab it take a quick picture of it and dump it in a folder and this was kind of pre-instagram you know when you have that save button and what's interesting is some of the stuff that i have in this is you know 2009 and then comes back in 2015 and then comes back in 2023 and um so i like that those images come round for different reasons and then i have a very geeky spreadsheet that um i started in lockdown with a friend and this is from talks to music to podcasts to artists books plays experiments mm. anything um mm. because i think we see things all the time and and what will be interesting to think about is why does one thing stick mm. and i kind of don't want to forget all the other stuff um so before i go into that maybe we can just kind of have a bit of a a chat about that and maybe i don't know just i'd love to hear your thoughts on it david 
there's a lot there already. Maybe you can keep the visuals on the screen I'll do that. so they're there I'll in keep case. Them rolling. In case there's something we want to refer to. Yeah, there's I'll keep it playing. Go for it. Well, I remember we had a photo London talk just before the pandemic. It was 2019, you and I. And there was something I didn't ask you then. What's that French expression? Esprit de l'escalier, you know, ah, the great thing you should have said just as you were leaving the party. And I wanted to ask just about the square format to begin with. And it is something you're associated with. And I, I wonder, first of all, is that is that how you see the world? Or is it is it the way that you want to make pictures of it? I mean, that's interesting, because if you look at my portfolio, there's probably four different formats. Okay. Um, so like I started on 35 mil, um, you know, shooting these images. Mm. Um, sorry, that was 35 mil. Then I went to 645. Um, you know, I think there's a great saying, a camera is just a box. Yeah. Uh, and I think that for me, what um, what's, what's more important is actually um, the feeling that I get when I look through the viewfinder. Yes. So a lot of people I know love kind of looking through a rangefinder. And yeah. what and I remember sort of asking my dad, like, what what camera should I buy? You know, what should I get? And so I went through this process of kind of holding a tank, you know, that I'd have to kind of hold up. And then I went through sort of a little Leica and all these things. And what I loved about the Hasselblad when I got it was that the screen was very clear and I was looking down. So I was kind of in this like in my own little it's like pulling the covers over your head. Do you know what I mean? You're kind of in your own little world. Yes. And so the, the actual square format for me only came from the fact that the process of using that camera yes. was actually more fitting. So if that had been 35 yeah. mil, I don't think it would have mattered to me to be completely- but you're, what, How the, the feeling of connection that you often, that the viewer gets from your photographs often comes from how centered they are. So that's really interesting you said, because that's something that I have been really pushed back against okay. in terms of, I remember- Can we see some of the images as you're talking? Yeah, sorry. Um, it's just that I can't see you and see the screen. So I feel a bit disjointed. You're not um, getting a little box at the side. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know why I can't. That's a bit weird. Let me, sorry, let me- Don't just... worry, I'm still here. <clears throat> I know you're still there. Let me see if I can do this. Will that work? Let's try again. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I've always like really um, been quite hyper aware, that's better I can see you now, um, of this idea of, oh, you just plonk somebody in the middle of the frame. Mm -hmm. uh, because every time that I, start a project, take a picture, embark on a visual journey. I want to look at what I don't like about my work or what I'm finding too easy or what doesn't feel right or um, how, I'm, how I can challenge myself and learn something new. Mm. And I began to realize that what I was doing was I wasn't putting people in the middle of the frame. And actually this is quite a good example of that. With, what I'm doing is I'm choosing my scene and then I'm sort of painting everything around and then I'm putting the person into the scene. Does that make sense? Oh, that's interesting. So, huh. so yeah. for example, a good example of that would be this one. Mm -hmm. Around, and I found this scene and I thought, okay, well, I like the way that everything is balancing out here. And I like the arch of those trees. So I want two people in the middle of those trees. So it was almost like the scene came first and then I knew that I wanted kind of like something that was holding these people so that all you did is focus on the people rather than the background and that's, that's, interesting. that's so interesting because it that's <clears throat> what i've often thought about your photographs and it's very clear in this one go back that one is that the space feels a little bit like <clears throat> a stage right it feels like a social stage you know where things happen and that so it's interesting that the, the people come in as players almost but they've paused yeah somewhere, somewhere. Well, then, so then what I did is I kind of changed my approach completely mm -hmm. and 
I don't know if I've got it in here. I don't think I have, but there's an image that I have where it was more about me dancing with the scene. So yeah. actually, because what I noticed is that then it was like this process of like, find your place, then kind of bring people in, then engage with the people. Cause it was like, you want to create a context and environment to tell a story and you want stuff to be happening, but you actually want the focus to be on this engagement. But you don't want it to be too static. So I was like, how can I loosen it up? Because this feels a bit static. This feels a bit, and there, there is, I think personally, when I look at images, sometimes there is a beauty to that silence and that staticness. But if you repeat that too often, yeah. it needs to kind of become anonymous and, and you, don't, you don't engage. Sure. So what I wanted to do was start creating images where I kind of had a scene, um, but what I was doing, especially, which is very hard when you're under the covers, um, yeah. and you're manually focusing and it's dark um, is that you kind of dance with what's going on in front of you and then when everything kind of falls into place then you click the shutter mm -hmm. that for me is harder I mean like people like you know um, Alex Webb do that incredibly well yeah. uh, in a very street documentary sense um, but for me it was like okay can I bring in that love of that that harmonious dance that Alex does with the intense engagement that you can have with somebody yeah. with with that kind of information that setting and that romance all at once and can i get it in focus it's interesting because nobody feels caught i never i never think of your photographs i don't know about never but mostly i don't think of them as you know shutter pictures where the, where the shutter is arresting the world and and producing yeah. the look of the picture they feel more like lens pictures than shutter pictures you know a kind of oops a kind of staring and a kind of contemplating not a not a grabbing of anything and not not a you know what? it's it, it's strange because what you're describing is something so difficult to describe so ungraspable but Maybe I can give you an example of a moment the other day that really, um, for me, kind of captured that, which was, I was just at the park with my friend and her baby and yeah. a beautiful child. And then, and I had my Hasselblad on me because I had a few frames that I needed to use up. And he started sort of balancing on the edge of the water and he was in these grubby trousers and the light, just went through the trees and just trickled and just came in and it was one of those moments where I was like oh hello you know and you're kind of like what's going on here yeah. and then for about what seemed like an un there, there was no there was no way of capturing time there was no way of knowing if it had been a minute or an hour mm. I, I began to stand with him and when he was looking at me we just sort of have these moments and then I'd click the shutter and right. then he'd kind of around and I'd wait for him to do something else and this went on for quite a while and it was a balance of kind of like our silent kind of like game mm. that we because before that we were running around with sticks you know and one of my cat toys um yes. like this very very gentle silent weird game that we were playing and then at the end like of my role I just kind of stood back and his mum my best friend came up to me and she just held me and she went holy fuck and I was like, yeah, holy fuck. She was like, that was so weird. And I was like, yeah, I know. And it's so strange because like, how often does someone else get yeah. under the covers? With you? Yeah, 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 yeah. How often do you, you know, and, and it, that reminds me why I love photography when yeah. those moments happen. Not, you know, the image is probably, it probably won't even come out. It's probably underexposed or overexposed or shit. But it's like, how do you, I don't but know why. That, but something you said really just kind of triggered that that kind but of maybe it yeah, was the shutter or the lens thing but i that what you're describing is such a kind of delicate fragile incalculable thing um i presume there are times where it, it just doesn't work out and just things things don't happen or the dance is not doesn't feel consummate or anything and it just I don't know does it, or you're not in it also seems quite mood based like do you wake up and think I'm not sure I can be in that dance with someone or 99% oh, of the time you can't force it it's kind of like <laughs> in love like yes. yeah okay yeah no like there's often times when I have to drag myself out to go and take pictures 
Um, and then, you know, or I will, I will walk around and be exhausted or even worse, I'll be bored. Yeah. And then I'll just see something. And it's almost like somebody has just injected me with a drug. And I'm like, oh, yes, you know, that's actually happened. Um, it's like, it brings me back to life. It's very, it reminds me of sort of a computer game, you know, when people kind of power up. Um, yeah. You, know, you kind of, you can't force it. You can't, you just, um, you stumble across it and you have to be open to it. And it's it's, being, I guess it's being open, yes. If, even, if, even if it's not going to work, you have to be open to the possibility that it might, I guess. There's, there's a question that my friend Jem, she does a wonderful podcast called The Messy Truth. Yeah. She asks this question to every artist at the end. She says, what is more important to you, the process or the product? Mm -hmm. And I feel like that is the most impossible question to ask an artist. For me, I mean, some people may be like, oh, 100% the process, I don't care about the product. Um, I really care. Like, I really care yeah. um, because it takes on a new meaning for me. So it's like the process is what it is. The process is the present. Do you know what I mean? And, and, it's, and it's this memory that is unchangeable. Yes. Um, and it's, it's hard and it's vile or it's beautiful and it's chaotic or it's calm. Mm. Like, there's so many memories of the process and journey, you journey through it but you can't share the process. And when you've got the final image or the final product or the final sculpture or the performance, when you share that and you can ignite emotion in someone else, or you can get someone else to reach into their story, or even, you know, you can learn from what they have to say about it, whether they like it or not. Yes. I just think that's just as valuable. And I want to create something interesting. Yeah. It's interesting how the, the the supposedly correct answer to the question of process or or product these days uh, is supposed to be process. Like like you would be too egocentric, or you would be, be you a know, complete narcissist. Not, you'd be shallow. Not, yeah, you wouldn't be attuned to process if you were just interested in product or or end product. Um, but in a way, the pro. I think an artistic understood understanding of process only becomes visible through the product in a way and there are lots of artists that will say it doesn't matter if I make anything or not it just happened you know I'm, I'm in it for the I'm in it for the process but I think there's there's something about particularly in photography the making of the image which in a kind of slightly retroactive way tells the artist something about what the process was you know did it, yeah, did it, yeah. Did it, and you know, we're talking about time, mm. and, and I think that that you know, like, really segues beautifully into this idea of kind of like how images have meaning over time and yeah. how they mean different things, and how the process during the process it means one thing, and during the end product, you know, being presented for the first time, it might mean something else, and then you know, if it's unearthed 50 years later, it might mean something else, or like one of you know, one of the images in this that I'm going to show of my inspiration is actually, you know, a, a, it's Hockney, the splash. And yeah. for me, the reason that image has stood the test of time, you know, the reason that has become one of my favourite images is because I've I got it. Yeah, story. I've got it. yeah, I've got it. Do you know what? I'm going to flip right to the end. Um, that's where it is. There, there it is. Yeah. Um, a bigger splash. David yeah. Hockney. Because, yeah. because like, you know, the, the joy that this evokes in my mum when I see her look at this image. I've, I've seen her look at it in a gallery once or twice now. And every time I talk about it or, or if I see her at a Hockney exhibition, I went, I went to a Hockney exhibition with her. And my mum is hard as nails. You know, she's very, I've, I've seen her cry like once in my life. And, uh, and it was after COVID and we went to go and see this exhibition. And she just stood there and her eyes were just filled. Ah. It was just there was so much joy, you know, that she was experiencing. And I was like, that's why I love that image. But I see it as that's such a Laura Panak composition. It's just that the person <laughs> has plopped into the water. <laughs> I love that. I love that you did. I mean, I, you're right. I've just fallen through the bottom of the picture. So. <laughs> I love that I chose the one image that I can probably relate to the most. But yeah, <laughs> um, 
yeah it's, it's interesting that that i'm i'm fascinated with artists points of reference that stay there over a long time and which points of reference kind of come and go because i think often um when young artists i kind of ask each other you know what are your what are your influences or what are the important things to you there's a chance that they'll they'll stick because you've verbalized them and it's a story that you then keep telling about yourself and you know we're unconscious beings most of the time and i sometimes wonder whether whether we really know what's influenced us the most or and is it just familiarity or is it trends yeah oh jeff wall sudden gust of wind tell me about I mean, this. i mean these Im it's images like this yeah uh, you know we were talking on the phone the other day and i think for me it's that i feel something different every time i revisit it and i fall in love with it again and again and again and it's i almost know within my bones that i'm not going to look at this image and not like it you know in 10 years whereas there's some images by some great artists and photographers who i kind of love for a few years and then I just fall out of love with them. It's like a relationship. Like, um, I love Alex Soth's work, but now when I look at it, I don't feel, I don't yeah. feel the same way. Mm -hmm. Like, and I think I loved it because it went through this huge spiking trend. Yes. And that's why also I've fallen out of love with it because these images like Jeff Wall or this painting. Oh, wow. Yeah. I just, for me, it, I just stumbled across them. You know, and they they kind of just entered my life in a really subtle way, yeah. Uh, where they, I just kind of, and and each of them have acted as this sort of small ingredient into my identity and what I've learned to love and what I've learned to like. You'll notice in a lot of the images, you know, the, look how earthy these tones are, and look oh, how yes. they are. Yeah, and yeah. Like, you know, that's my palette. You know, I love well, I'm, immediately, I'm immediately thinking, what would Laura do? Would she go up to the guy spinning on his heel there? Uh, would you, would you pick out each of the each of the figures there individually somehow? And then with Christine as well, the the Andrew Wyeth painting, which is which is amazing. Yeah, I can just imagine you calling out to her to would you mind standing? <laughs> It's so interesting. It's funny, actually. I I was once commissioned to do, and I you know me, I don't write, but I it's the only piece of writing I've ever been commissioned to do, and it was to write a story for the photographer's gallery. And I had to take a Gregory Cruzen picture and I had to write a story of mm. what was happening. And it for the like, I was like, wow, that yes. is like something that we do. And I did I didn't realize it. And you know, when I'm looking at this image, I have a whole narrative. Yes what happened before after of who this girl was when she was three or four and then who she grows up to be or if she lives to grow old like and I, I think that maybe that's also led into my fascination with portraiture well don't you feel it's interesting you say that because I often you know often photographers like to describe themselves as visual storytellers you hear that expression a lot these days but I tend to think of photographs but the photograph is what you get in the suspension of the story. It's a story you can't know. Yes. It might hand it back to the viewer to imagine it, but photography is an odd medium if you were genuinely a storyteller. Yes. It, but I think that's its power. It's like if you try and flip over to filmmaking, the hardest thing to do is to keep the mystery. Yeah. Because within a photograph, you have the power of mystery and subjectivity. I agree, but I feel that the mystery is to do with the suspension of the story. Yeah. The, the, the still image is the, is the gift that you get in exchange for sacrificing the story in it's a true. way. Well, I guess it, that I would say that that's quite a kind of glass, half empty way of looking at it because you're sort no, of- No, no, because it hands so much back to the, to the viewer's imagination, yeah. like you say, in the way that film might not. Yes. Yeah. Um, but that makes the that makes the photograph stand slightly out of time, and time time is our theme. But I always feel that your your photographs in their 
in their poise and in their poignance are a, are a standing either out of time or in a moment of time. The, wor the world, the kind of chaos of the world might be swimming around, but not in this photograph. It's just, a, you know, I'm talking about yours, not, not Jeff's. <laughs> sudden gust yeah, there's something very calming about Jeff, about this image despite its absolute chaos yeah it's a still it doesn't, it doesn't still. evoke um anxiety in me whereas whereas it kind of shares but oh what because of the chaotic and the the evident shutter or many shutters it's a it's a digital montage isn't it i remember asking him actually why jeff wore why he didn't make films and he just said there's too much movement really there's too much movement. It's interesting. Mm. Um, I'm going to move on a little bit to talk about also, I just want, I wanted your opinion and then maybe we should also involve the audience as well. Absolutely, yeah, we've reached the second half of our hour. Awesome. Go on. I just, I just had some stuff about performance and I wondered, mm. as we're talking about sort of, you know, I wanted to include sort of installation work like Taryn Simon's work which for me was one of the most powerful exhibitions I've ever seen mm. uh, and and there was a dance that I saw last week that um was fantastic it said as well and and I wondered kind of if you like how with all your oracle knowledge you could kind of pinpoint the difference between as we're talking about the time of an image and and how that kind of um sits with us and stays with us and then a performance and what the difference is it's funny you know I always think of the I'm not going to be an oracle but I always think of the the slightly impoverished language that there is around photography for talking about these things you know whether it's stupid terms like staged or documentary or uh there's there's nothing to capture the subtleties but I, I do think there's something which I do get from your photographs, which is that the, the, because the camera points things out uh, in the world, it then makes them perform themselves in a way. There's, there's, photography is just a, a theatricalizing thing. It, it just turns things into unexplained performances of themselves you know like the treeness of a tree or the armness the, the armness of Christina's arm in the uh, although that's a painting but it's clearly got a relation to photography there's some, there's something maybe it's just to do with still images and the way that they empower what they, do is they take away the the representation of drama but they give you the drama of representation, right? The 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 kind of presentness of things, and so I mean, I always think there's a very natural relation between photography and performance art, and photography and sculpture, and photography and painting, and photography and cinema, and photography and literature. I mean, there's bound to, there's bound to be these crossovers and dialogues and a kind of flowing back and forth even though all of these mediums have their own properties and their own distinct conditions on you think that they have a different effect on us in terms of time like for example if you go yeah. into a performance mm. you might touch something for it for you know um i don't know like you know the next hour and talk about or a film you see a film and you you know you go for a drink or dinner afterwards and you're just unraveling this film yes whereas how we kind of the relationship that we have with photography seems slightly different and because I'm a photographer I don't really know what that would be like for someone that isn't <laughs> well I think photography is already fragmentary it's interesting what happens when people recall a movie you know because most of the time you know most films are narratively structured but narrative is is not what people remember they remember this scene, that scene, that gesture, that shot. It's almost like the narrative is like the booster rocket to get all of the fragments into orbit. And the, the booster rocket falls away. Nobody remembers the plot. Yes. Really. And they, actually the plot is all the same in most films anyway. Like right. Narrative. Yeah, but the interesting thing is when you're watching a movie, the narrative seems to be the most important thing. What's happening next? Who's reacting to what? Who wants what? 
What's the aim? How's this going to resolve? Like an hour later, it's like, oh, do you remember that bit with the... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but photography is, photography is already those bits, right? Yeah. It's, it's already those... There's nothing to fragment. It's, it, it, is a, it is fragments. That's, that's what it works in. For me, anyway. It's curious that you mentioned that, though, because my... My path into photography was loving cinema as a sort of 10, 11, 12 year old. This is just showing my age. It's just before like home video. And so I would buy books about movies. And then I fell in love with the film stills, often more than the films, didn't care for the films. And there are, there are some movie stills I adore so much that I won't see the movie. <laughs> and what about? what about for, like for example the one of the people that i put in here is roy anderson yes and well roy anderson he is a filmmaker that photographers love but he was also a photographer yes i think part partly because of his relation to the 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 kind of proscenium frame and the kind of tableau form oh, yeah yeah they are pictures that move you know yeah. each, each shot in a roy anderson is a is a is a motion picture to use the old like <laughs> yeah yeah I mean that's why I love it because I'm somebody that um and that's one thing that we obviously definitely share is that when I'm watching anything even if it's killing Eve I'll be screenshotting yeah, yeah. Certain scenes, you know, Oof, yeah that's great that's great I was watching this amazing crackly early video black and white of the American photographer Walker Evans talking to students Gary Winogrand students in 1974 the year before he died and one of the students said uh, uh, Mr Evans do you still go to the movies a lot he said oh yeah and uh, she said well what have you seen lately and he said I've, I've seen two films by Robert Altman uh, The Long Goodbye and McCabe and Mrs Miller have you seen them and she said no and he said those films are a marvelous bunch of photography that's really interesting. It's such yeah. a great expression, isn't it? And I think, I mean, every, everything that a, that a filmmaker can do is available to a photographer. Uh, and maybe if you're a photographer, all, all you want is the frame grab from a movie. I don't know, because I can't think in films. I yeah. can't, I actually... I like somebody else filling in the pieces. Yes. And I, I like the mystery too much. I like kind of not knowing why I'm grabbing something. Yeah, oh, okay, that's interesting. Well, that's good in a way because that's, I think part, I think a, a motivation to make a photograph or to take a frame grab, and maybe they amount to the same thing, is the moment of least sureness. Like something has piqued your interest it's natural yeah it's but, uh, but the it's very unformed and the emotions and the feelings might be very mixed i mean i often think of this when i look at someone like the work of someone like diane arbus i think it seems to me she's pressed the button at the moment of most mixed feelings yeah yeah <laughs> not like oh that's the thing i wanted to communicate at the moment of oh i I don't know. I don't know what's going on here. This is the thing that needs to be yeah. uh, trapped somehow. Or yeah. I don't know. And of course, you know, when you when you do that with a movie, are you and it's the same thing happens when a they use like a freeze frame in a movie. Two things happen. One, the, obviously, the motion falls away, so that means story falls away. And any sound falls away because there's not a sound equivalent of a freeze frame. And so it immediately just becomes this, you know, visionary, mysterious thing. Anyway, sorry, I'm just... <laughs> you asked. That's how I feel. I love about. it. I, lo I love it. Okay. Okay. We've got some questions coming in, uh, and I'm not mindful of the time, but we should be able to look at quite a few of these. Uh, I need to what... stop sharing my screen and then you. It's all right. I can I can see the questions. It's nice to have visuals on the screen, unless you want us bigger. 
No, yeah, I'm good. Uh, someone who's come up as anonymous, sorry about that, or maybe you wanted to be anonymous, says, uh, I'm drawn to and struck by the gazes cast into the lens by many of Laura Panak's photographic portraits. I'm curious as to how she would situate and characterize the direct visual address of the collaborator subjects in such portraits. Besides street photography, are there any other direct or oblique influences on this regard to the camera or regard camera? Uh, do the gazes captured while shooting persist in the still images as exhibited or question mark, don't quite follow that. Uh, to what degree do the viewers own acts of looking meet a gaze, although perhaps one relegated to images in these portraits where the subject stares back? Hmm. Staring back. What what is going on when somebody looks into the camera, a photograph is made, and then when you print the photograph, what are they looking at? Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if this is going to answer the question, um, but my kind of, I, I guess, my relationship to, to that process, in a sense, for me, yeah. I think of it as this sort of three as a triangle. Yes. Yeah. Myself, the person that I'm photographing, and the person looking at the photograph. And right. we're, we're all there. There's no kind of... And it goes in different ways. There's no kind of one direction. And yeah. I think what I strive for with that gaze um, or to capture that gaze is actually, um, it's kind of like a wall dropping. So for okay. me, um, there is this romance that kind of, as I was talking about with that idea of having the covers over your head, there is this very isolated connection that I've never had in anything else but photography. Right. Uh, when I'm taking a portrait, and it's it hasn't happened many times in my life. Yes. A handful where I am looking through the lens, and someone is looking at me, or they might not even be looking at me, and there is this very eerie, weird, silent, purgatory space. Um, and I'm sure photographers have written about it or spoken about it before, but it's 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 almost like, and it's something I've described it as before which is probably not the best way to describe it, it's probably quite inappropriate, is when you're about to kiss somebody, sometimes you have that kind of held moment when like, when you're kissing somebody for the first time where it's this sort of nervous energy, but it's also like this very intense connection. Yes. Um, and that feels close to it, but it's not because it's very, very different because you don't want to kiss the person that you're photographing, but it's just like a very, very intense engagement. Yeah. And it, feels like you're sort of stepping into their body and they're stepping into yours and it, it feels very balanced right and it feels safe mm -hmm. it's almost like you kind of someone just sees you they just see you and it's often happens with kids as well where they'll they'll just and it, it, I think it's when your your mask drops your presentation of self your ego everything drops maybe it's the ego dropping maybe that's what it is and you're just present and you were talking about the idea of kind of grabbing stills and and having that moment you know like Arbus when you don't really know sort of why you're you're sort of capturing that and that for me is a very meditative state it's a state of flow or it's a state of of total tranquility in a sense yes. or the worldliness and I think that Portraiture for me has the power to do that because I can look at a landscape and feel yeah. emotion. And, and some photographers manage to capture that beautifully. Mm -hmm. What I love is that I'm kind of also offering it to someone else mm -hmm. and if both decide and also if fate decides or whatever. Yes, but the, kind of that's interesting. But the viewer just just wasn't there they give they are but, given but then the viewer when they look at the image mm -hmm. they might have that they might also then look into the person's eyes yes and have that connection too but they the person it's not a person it's a de, it's a depiction once it's in an image it's a story and, they, it's and a story. they can't look back i mean you often hear photographs you know, a person in a photograph described as like returning the gaze and all of that stuff. 
but they're no, not. No, no, you're right, you're right. There's a very different relationship between this fusion between myself and whoever I'm, you know, working with and photograph yeah. to, because when, when I guess a viewer looks at, at the image, what they're doing is they're bringing their connection and their story and their narrative in order to connect. So it's kind of bouncing back, isn't it? It's kind of right. like you're sort of looking at that person and seeing yourself. It's like a mirror, really. Whereas when I'm photographing somebody, I imagine there's some of that as well, where I'm sort of seeing myself. Yes. It's more like a fusion. I'm always caught, I think, with very poised pictures of people looking into the camera. Sometimes I feel that these are the most naturalistic, kind of ethical, connected things. And then I, and then sometimes if I, particularly if I look at the photograph for longer, like if I stay with it for a few minutes more, it just becomes, everything that was familiar becomes estranged. Jesus, what are they looking at? Then I'm looking at them as if they're looking at me, but they cannot look at me. I'm, it's a very, it's a very imagined relation to what was, what might've been going on. Uh, it just the, the mystery just deepens the longer you stay with such a picture. If when you first look at it, it feels very familiar, comfortable. You feel you can step into whatever relationship was going on, uh, but over time it estranges itself and becomes something. Else. Maybe it's just me. And may, no, and what you're talking about is really poignant in terms of time, because what you're saying is, as we change, our relationship with that work changes. So, you know, when you look at that image again, like you were saying, and, and I was agreeing with you, you know, my favourite works are ones we return to time and time again. Yeah. And something more. It gives yeah. something more. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, I think well, I hope you have a good answer to that question. Karen Wisser says, uh, David commented that, quote, the vocabulary of photography is very limited. Question to both. Could engaging blind and partially blind people interested in photography help to address some of the ocular centric perspective and othering of this vocabulary? Yeah, take it away from the visual altogether. Has that crossed your mind, Laura? What? What I was actually thinking was um, less about sight and more about consciousness. Mm. Mm. Like the way that Antoine Agatar, like, has to often, I've heard him say, maybe I'm completely saying something inappropriate and wrong, or maybe it was someone else, where they, you know, they like being intoxicated or in mm. absolute exhaustion yes. to allow that process to be. So it's almost like they're not even looking. Yeah. I often think I often think that we're all we're all only ever partially looking. We don't we don't have the dead cold indifference of the camera. I remember once um, when Nelson Mandela first came to London, he came to Brixton. He gave a you know, he walked down Brixton High Street, you know, surrounded by an entourage, and he went up some stairs to the recreation centre and waved to the crowds that were just ecstatic to see him. And I was in the crowd. And, you know, we waved and cheered and he went inside. And the next day, I was living with about four or five people. And my girlfriend at the time bought all the newspapers to see how they'd covered this moment. And a photograph of Mandela was there on the cover of all the pictures. And my girlfriend said, did anyone see Prince Charles, now King Charles? And all of us said, no, what, no. And we looked at the paper and he was standing, <laughs> Charles was standing next to Mandela. And none of us had quote unquote seen him. Optically, we must have seen him. But something symbolic was wrong about, you know, someone from the monarchy <laughs> being there. At, and and so we, we had selected him out, but we're always selecting out. We can't, we're always doing it. You cannot look at everything that the world offers and you can't even look at everything that the, that the camera offers. I find it, I mean, we're always, I wouldn't say we're partially blind. I wouldn't go that far, Karen. But I think our vision is is always conditioned by forces we don't quite understand. 
<laughs> somehow. Uh, whether whether that, I, I mean, I would like a vocabulary of photography that recognised that, that, that looking is a very unconscious. Well, it also makes me think of Monet and how, you know, those lovely pictures of the Waterloo Bridge and how as he painted them over time when he became more and more blind. Yeah. And seen those and the way they change. Yeah. And it's just so beautiful because it makes you think about what, what is in front of you mm. and what you're seeing and what you're feeling. And what I love about those images is you don't see any frustration. You see curiosity. Yes. So oh, that's interesting. You yeah. don't, oh, you know, well, I'm losing my sight. He's not trying to grasp back the first picture that he took, okay. uh, that, that he painted. He's no, it's, it's all a sense. It's all it's all a sensation that he wants to value. That's that's true, and maybe a ritual as well. But but it's that curiosity of what will I see next? And, yeah. and and what's interesting is he knows that what's in front of him hasn't changed. No, it's interesting. At the time I got at the time I got into photography, I was beginning to I was beginning to need glasses, and I was losing twenty twenty vision, and I'm quite short sighted and. I value it actually because I do get to look at the world out of focus, which, which people with 2020 vision can't do. <laughs> I mean, say, no, saying that losing my sight would be. Oh yeah, of course. You know, I, 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 and I and also you know it's worth saying you know Karen, I think there's also obviously so much more space for people um, that you know like have partial sight and, and and are blind like with it. I think there's some amazing work that has been done um regardless of kind of you know yeah. how how it comes about um i think i can't remember the name of the photographer but there was somebody that um i met that once worked with sort of light paintings yeah and, and the participants were kind of you know they were they were given they were they had a sense of the scene and then they were painting it with torches mm. it beautiful mm. yeah no, and um, Sophie Cowell made a piece of work where she was collaborating with blind people, um, which is fascinating. There's also, I can't remember the name of the movie now, there's a great Australian movie, I think, made in the late 80s, early 90s, about a blind photographer, which is extraordinary, I think. I should re-watch that. Anyway, let's move on through more questions. Uh, Richard Gosnold. Hi, Richard. Imagine you are just about to press the shutter release. At that point, have you ever stopped and chosen not to make a portrait with someone? If so, why? And did you regret it later? Let's go to, if I've got it on here. All right, I'm going to, give me, give me a sec. Uh -huh. I've got it on my desktop. I'm just going to pop this in there because this is very relevant. Mm -hmm. To, was it Richard's? Richard, yes. Find it. So the image that I'm going to get up is um, uh, the Kevin Carter image. Oh, yes. And um, that taught me a lot. Um, I used to. Here it is. Sorry, I've got so much crap on my desktop. Here it is. Um, <laughs> all right. I can't see that yet. Can you? Yeah. Okay. So it's a very haunting image um, by Kevin. Uh, really changed my. I was very young. I think I was maybe eighteen, um, and I was studying. I did a year at St Martin's, and then after that, I decided to try photography, and I just started it. And I just wanted a. I I, I couldn't take enough pictures. I was out all the time with a Pentax, just shooting black and white, hundreds of rolls, and sometimes not even processing them. And then I was with my sister and we were in my local town and there was a massive explosion and a car had gone into a bank. Like they'd, uh, and so I went into Boots and I got a black and white snap camera and I started photographing and there was a huge crowd of people. Mm. Policemen just like dragged me into this crowd and said, you're disgusting. And he took my camera and he broke it. And he said, look in that car. And it was like a burning car, you know. And he said, how would you feel if that was your sister or your mother? 
you know, and, and he, he basically was sort of saying, how dare you dehumanize people? Mm -hmm. And I think that it was the first time that I had had to think before I pressed the shutter or I, I had to consider that concept. And then I learned about Kevin. And, and I think what's so interesting is um, there's so many rabbit holes we could go down here. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, it comes down to intent and it comes down to personal choice. And now when I press the shutter, I, I think before I press the shutter and many a time I will press it, regret it and never show that image to anyone. Mm. And not because it's not because I know it's a bad moment, but because say for example, I'm photographing a Jewish woman at the moment and I might be photographing and then she might just start eating something and I take a picture and I get the picture back and she looks terrible. You know, she just, she, it's not a very flattering picture. I know I'm not going to show that to anyone. I know that's a really bad example and doesn't live up to Kevin. But um, I guess what I'm saying is like, my intention would be to respect the people that I'm working with as much as I can. Yes. And, and knowing that I have to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Because you're never going to get that moment back. But I think what's interesting about Kevin's story is that within capturing that moment, that horrific scene, he has said so much. He has, you know, helped maybe save thousands of lives by delivering one message. And to me, when I look at that picture, I don't think, why the fuck didn't he pick up that child? I think he was there horrified mm -hmm. by the situation and he wanted to turn around to the world and go, this is fucked. <laughs> this is so fucked up. Like, we need to do something about this. Um, <laughs> Is it, there's the situation that's fucked up, but there's also the kind of the photographer making the cheap rhetorical trick. Like, if I stand here, the vulture will be there. There will be a pictorial rhetorical implication. It's telling you, it's not showing, it's not just showing you, it's telling you what to think at the same time. You know, this was, this was Roland Barthes. Oh, okay. This was Roland Barthes' objection to, to, a certain kind of photojournalism that wasn't that wasn't content with just showing you things. It wanted to instruct you what to feel at the same time. And at that point, Bart says, the photograph has shuddered on your behalf and you are, you're out of the equation, actually. Because it's completely unbiased and you're, you are a victim of the narrative that is presented to you. Which I, I totally agree. And, and then there's also that thing of, you know, how long do you wait Apparently he wanted to wait until the vulture spread its wings. You know, it's kind of, there's so many moral questions there. And I, but I think you have to respect the intellect of the viewer and you have to say, you know, okay, maybe this is a very biased perception of the situation, but I'm going to present how I feel about this and what I want to say. And then you have, you know, you have the ability to make up your mind. You can research, you can question, you can, have conversations and there's the complicated thing about whether whether certain ends justify the means Let, let's say a photograph that we might all find objectionable uh has a good effect in the world let, let let's say it gets to a particular politician who is able to make a policy change uh i wonder if this developed any like i wonder if this saved a lot of lives mm. i wonder if this helped a lot of people and i like to think that it did because I, I truly, I mean, maybe I'm just super naive, mm -hmm. but I feel like the intention behind the photographer was not malicious. I don't think it was egotistic. I could be wrong. I could be, I don't know the guy. I don't know enough about this image. I think photographs have a way of covering their traces with regards to intention. Can you talk more about that? What do you mean? I don't think they, I don't think they're able to declare them. Um, what they are. It's true that we want to be able to respond to an image on the basis that we know that it's quote unquote either coming from a good place or a bad place. <laughs> uh, but what we're doing in that moment is absolving our own selves from responding. We, we tell ourselves the photograph was well intended or the photograph was badly intended. Maybe. Ra rather than. What we're also talking about is time and truth. Sure, you know? sure. But we, I don't think we can know from a photograph. I don't think it's... Anyway, let's move on. Can we have... Yeah. Can, we, can we put another image on the screen? I'm a little... 
anxious about that one. Yeah, sorry. That was a bit of a bit of a segue, wasn't it? Hang on a sec. Isaiah Jordan, uh, I'm really interested in your relationship with people in your project, Island Symmetry. Could you talk about that? Yeah, sure. Um, maybe a bit more specific. Maybe you can add on to that. David, oh, you still there? I'm here. Uh, maybe you can kind of add on to that question because I don't really know. Well, do your do each of your projects? Well, first of all, let's let's scroll it back a bit and say, do you go into something knowing it's a project, or does it become a project somehow in the midst of things? It's completely dependent. If I'm assigned or commissioned to do something, I know it has an origin. Okay. Um, so but I would say most of my work, no, I don't have an intention of the end of what it will be. And I often don't know what the hell I'm doing. Like I've been doing projects for like eight or nine years. I have no idea why, which I'm, you know, I was listening to another photographer talk the other day and they were sort of saying how every time they approach a project, they know their end goal. They know what it's for, why they're doing it, how they're going to do it. Yeah. Um, whereas I'm kind of a little bit, maybe um, <laughs> naively and romantically led by the process of just wandering and being curious and sort of delving into that hole yeah. and where it takes me. I think, uh, I think I do know kind of what I want to get out of it in terms of learning. So mm -hmm. that is my approach. So with Island Symmetries, I was like, right, like I said to you, I was, I, one of my main kind of object, objective goals with that was to stop chucking people in the middle of the frame and <laughs> you know and to to be like what like how am I dancing with this a bit more how am I a bit how am I being a bit more playful how am I involving more than one person within the scene what's the relationship how can I kind of and also you know we're talking about timelessness one thing that's very important about that project for me is it is about the sort of slight details of time because what it talks about is geography and it talks about how you know, the nearest thing to you is the most dissimilar and the furthest away you go from the point that you are, you will find the most similar thing. So for me, I knew that that also had quite a relationship with time and trends mm. in terms of clothing, in terms of vaping, in mm. terms of, you know, certain kind of details within the images that might show a relationship between the geographical boundaries and the age groups but unify the idea of adolescence and hopefully kind of have a sense of timelessness, but also stand in a period of time. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. I always think there's a very deep relationship between photography as a medium and adolescence, you know, because an adolescent has got this complicated relation to time themselves, they're kind of caught between one thing and another. Uh, they have a problem of depth and surface. They have a problem about being misread. <laughs> yeah. And they can, they can, you know- They know where they are in the world. Yeah, exactly. They're completely un <laughs> stuck in purgatory. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the adolescent is, is- And it's a transition. It's like a Polaroid, isn't it? It's like film developing. It's kind of this idea of like going from one- you know, material thing into another, you're taking light and you're forming it into an object. It is this kind of butterfly. Mm. Sort of thing. And when, it's, when it's gone, it's gone. Another, another question in relation to this idea of time, Laura, is, I mean, you mentioned projects that have been ongoing for many, many years. W would you, ideally, would you rather a project just just didn't end and you could keep coming back to it because I often wonder with photographers what is, is it is it just a pragmatic decision to end a project like I've got enough or I've covered it or I think for me it's am I bored, bored. And, and and if I'm bored I can step away and I can always return for me it's what's beautiful is it's a relationship that unless I'm capturing something that is time dependent Yes. So if you are capturing an event or, you know, for example, there's a project in Germany that I want to do and it's about a place that is changing, it's evolving. So I have to hurry the fuck up and I have to get there and do it. Um, but, you know, when we're talking about time, for me, um, the beauty of a relationship is time. 
you know, the more time that you spend with somebody, the deeper that, you know, the more your relationship will grow, regardless of, you know, who it is. I feel like that is sort of generally speaking, quite a given factor that, you know, um, and, and experience comes into that as well. If you're in a tsunami together, that's probably going to speed up time quite a bit, mm. uh, time that you spend together. So I think I'm quite intrigued by that idea of spending time with people. And I'm, you know, contradictively, I'm actually, you know, I actually, a lot of the time don't want to spend time with people. Um, but I, when I'm working on those projects like Island Symmetries, I, I enjoy sort of unraveling those relationships mm. and spending time with people that photography has brought me to. Mm. You know, we, we've kind of met through just, just this act of photography. Yeah. Um, and also my relationship to that age is now changing as I'm getting older. So it's kind of like, you know, time is also kind of fighting against me in a sense, because when I was 21 and going to meet 13 year olds and hang out with them, they'd be like, yeah, cool, of course you can. Now yeah. when a year old woman turns up, they're like, uh, bit weird, you know. Well, maybe related to that, I, I know we're running over the hour a little bit. Let's let's go for a few more minutes because there are some great questions here. Uh, right. We have a certain momentum to things. Uh, related to that, Cheryl Tate, hi Cheryl, asks, uh, do you keep in touch with any of the sitters in your images after the photos are done? Yes, I do. Um, I try to. I think it's really important um, for a number of reasons. Um, I mean, it's like it's like anything, you know, you can never do everything and get everything right. But for me, it, it, it's also if I'm photographing young people, um, I'm aware of the responsibility of that. So, for example, there was a piece in the FT recently and they wanted to use the, the island symmetries work. And so luckily for me, I had the contact details of the kids in Tasmania. So I reached out to them on Facebook and I said, look, I want to donate, you know, some money to you because you're part of this project. We collaborated on this. Um, here's the context. Here's what I suggest. Um, and then I went to the FT and I said, look, it's really important for me that it's very clear that these young people are not representative of the article. You know, they're absolutely nothing to do with it. And they were really cool and they really respected that. They, they were amazing. I mean, the, um, the boys that were in the images actually didn't really care, but um, it was just important to me because also they might care in 10 years. Um, so it's like, I just wanna, or their parents might care. Um, so yeah, I do, I do really try and be a good person, but also I'm interested. I've bonded with these people, you know, I wanna know, you know, what happens to Zach in 10 years. I wanna know he's all right. Or with Baruch and his journey, you know, I wanna know if he's, you know, studying and, you know, where he is in the world, that he's safe and that he's inspired and, and how his life has turned out. So um, for, for logistical reasons, yes, but also for the, that duration of wonder and curiosity and, and gratitude that I've met these people. I, mm. I can't photograph somebody if I'm not interested in them. And I don't think they can allow me to photograph them if they're not interested in me. Um, Good answer. So, yeah. Oh, Amelia's asking something that came out of our discussion about eye contact and lens contact. Um, if, if you're working with something like a Hasselblad where you have to look into the viewfinder, at that moment, you're not looking at the person. You, you're having to you're having to let go of the eye contact in order to make the the photograph. What happens there? Is there a quick look to the person just before you take the picture? Or Do you know, it's so weird. What happens when I'm photographed? I, David, I could be naked in a ditch. I like I have no idea what is going on. I really relate to <laughs> frontline photographers. Yes, because I'm the I am so unaware. Like things could be blowing up around me, and I could be like, wait, 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 wait. The light. <laughs> like I'm just so present. Um, and I remember Olivia Arthur once saying to me that what she loved about the Hasselblad is it's kind of like you're bowing to the person that you're about to photograph. And mm. I love that ritual. I love that idea of you kind of. Um, because for me, the last thing I want is for somebody to feel like I'm covering myself up. You can't see me, but I can see you. You know, it's kind of like 
shooting a gun behind a wall. Like that is not what I want. So I don't think, uh, I think I imagine what happens is I'm conversing quite a bit and then I'm reaching down and then I'm looking through and I'm probably talking whilst I'm looking through. Mm. Uh, and I imagine that then I just, a lot of people have said that I'm very quiet when I photograph, which is probably just that they know that I'm never quiet. So it's uh, just, I'm just not talking. That's um, but I think maybe it's that unspoken silence. So, um, and I think that in answer to her, to Amelia's question is something I try to do quite a bit, actually more so in the past few years, is have friends or strangers or, you know, whatever, photograph me. Hmm. Because I want to remember what it's like to be photographed and, and to what, what it's like to look through that bit of glass and what you can see and what you can't see. And I think that's also why I'm quite interested in photographing children, because I wonder what they see, you know, what they think it is. Yes, yeah. complicated. Kind of related to that, Tobias, hi Tobias, says, how do you feel after you've made a portrait photograph? I have a strange feeling of artificial intimacy ended, like a brief fling is over. <laughs> um, I was going to say something really inappropriate then. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't think there's one set way that I feel. Yeah. It's almost like saying, how do you feel after you go for dinner with a friend? <laughs> like, you're always going to feel different yes. with any relationship and any experience. I can tell you the feeling I love is when I've started a day not knowing someone oh, or that's... seeing a side to someone and then you get to the end and then you're like, whoa. And I've often had to do that in a very small amount of time. So I think maybe that has influenced my process. I remember I photographed Ian McEwen once when I was quite young and he was always a hero of mine, um, one of my favorite writers. And I knew I had about four minutes with him and so he arrived, his PR arrived, and I just looked at him and I said, when was the last time that you thought about killing yourself? Or something really inappropriate like that, like something so inappropriate. But in my head, I was like, I just want to get there quick. And it was like the worst thing to say. And he responded in the best way. And we had like the best conversation, actually. And he was saying like, because he knew that I wasn't saying like you personally. We were talking about a feeling um, and I'm sure it was slightly related to something that had come up. Like, I hope it wasn't just out of the blue. Um, but he said something along the lines of like, he always found it very strange when you're standing at a train platform and you're sort of swaying and you think I could just fall. And, yeah. we were, and then we just kind of like talked about that. And I was like, oh, you are the, the amazing guy. I knew you were. Um, so when you have to have that like intense four minutes, I've never forgotten those four minutes. Um, and, I, and I would definitely, I don't think I'd do that now. <laughs> I, don't think I, I, I really hope I wouldn't say something as inappropriate as that, but that's an extreme demonstration of, of that desire to kind of get to know somebody. And then you have this kind of transition, as you said. Well, I guess the commissioned portrait is a little bit like speed dating or something, isn't it? It is. Yeah, it is. And, and actually, your role is not just to take a good picture. Your role is to go and take a picture of something you may not necessarily want to or be inspired to take a picture of. And you need to make that other person feel as absolutely comfortable as possible and in control. Well, maybe related to that, and I think we're going to have to make this the last question. We can't, there's a lot of really great questions. We can't get to them all, I'm afraid. And we're already running nearly 15 minutes over. So we'll make this the last because it relates to a number of things that have come up. Juan Kobo says, uh, do you at some point, do you at some point believe that portrait photography is all about creating a fiction about the sitter? It's really not about the sitter's real persona, but the fiction the photographer is dreaming about. I'm going to say something very pop psychology now. Do it. I think all relationships are built on fantasy. Um, and I'm a, I'm, I'm a romantic, I'm a born romantic, but I think that we all create a fantasy of all of the people in our lives and who we are. 
you know, yeah. especially more now so than ever. So um, I guess what we're talking about as well is about the truth. And I think that the truth in photography could be an endless conversation, mm. but intention is what it comes down to for me. So if I am intending to present somebody in a curious, creative, kind and compassionate way, then I hope a good image will come out of that. Do you know what I mean? I and do know what you mean, but are you, are you always thinking about one? Are you, are you thinking about something not definitive, but, but singular, that this, this image would be your gesture towards what was possible, not like two images or three images or a sequence or, or pictures of the same people that might come up at different times in a project. Are, are you thinking about the single image? I don't know if I do, because I, again, I don't know how much I think about this, this goal or this outcome. Sure. Um, I think I'm more curious in the same way that if I said to you, if you could just have one image created of mm. you, what would it be? I think it would be a disaster. It's a nightmarish. I'll see you next Thursday. Um, <laughs> but like, uh, like well, you know, we, we have so many different sides. And I think about this in, in, you know, photographs that have become extraordinarily famous. I just think, what would it be to be the person in that picture that became so extraordinarily well known? And also, the fact that they they are just stuck in time. Absolutely, it's a real that 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 would be a nightmare for me. I think. Or beautiful, because when you reach the age of like seventy, you're still beautiful in twenty one. I don't know, who, like. Or you and on that note. <laughs> Laura, we're going to have to stop, I'm afraid. Uh, Thank we you have everyone for all your questions. I'm feeling so self-conscious now that everyone thinks I'm a complete maniac. But um... uh, We knew that anyway, Laura. Thanks. That was very, very generous of you. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks for the questions and uh, hope to see you another time. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye.